Hey everyone, my name is Ken Ingold, and I want to take a moment to thank you for joining us online. We're going to worship together, read some scripture with one of our teaching pastors, and hear more about how our church is being a good neighbor in our community. We may be in San Diego, but if you're not in our area, we still have resources for you to check out. Make sure you subscribe to Garden Music on YouTube and our daily devotional podcast. Let's go to church together. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sham. I'm, I'm one of the executive directors here, and uh, I want to start by asking you a question this morning, which is, how will we as a church reach this generation of youth in North County? During our Clyde offering, we shared how we are committed to raising up the next generation of Gophers leaders, and this year we're doing that in several ways. But I want to share two real quickly. One, uh, as uh, we introduced, we hired a new student pastor, Isaac Fox, a few weeks ago. But secondly, yes. And secondly, uh, it is through our weekly uh, Tuesday youth program called Youth Night or Big Tuesday. And during these nights, 
we are uh, third to twelfth graders are able to grow and build their foundation of truth. Uh, I was ministering on a college campus for over 20 years, and do you know the reason? The majority of the reason why these wayward freshmen would later come back to church, and this is what they said to me. They said it's because of what happened in their youth group, right? So during their youth group years. They were able to grow their foundation of truth through God's word, and that's what God used to draw them back. And so, if you are a parent here and you have kids and middle schoolers or high schoolers, and they have never been to Big Tuesday, which starts this week, encourage them to try it out three times because we believe uh, it's going to add value in their life. Now, if you if they're already coming to Big Tuesday, encourage them. Then to go first and invite their friends this week on Tuesday. Sound good? And so, how will we as a church reach this generation of youth uh, in North County? It is through Big Tuesday. You know what? Every single one of us that gives to our church out of your generosity, you are actually participating in creating that space where we can reach more students in our community and city. And so, if you're wondering this morning, hey, how can I invest? How can I participate in that? Please go to CRB.gives, or you can scan the QR code on your armrest. And if you're old school, we have uh, offering boxes in the back. And together, let's reach our youth for the glory of God. Amen. And with that, let's continue to worship today.
Did you know that we have an email newsletter that goes out every single week filled with all the details of what's happening at the church? Subscribe to stay up to date on everything going on in Impact, Sunday services, and everything else here at the Church at RB. Visit thechurchrb.org forward slash newsletter to sign up and have the Good Neighbor News delivered directly to your inbox.
so good to see you. So thrilled that you're here, whether you're in person or online. Hey, before we dive into a new series together today that I'm incredibly excited about, uh, we would love for you to help us make plans for 2023 as a church. On your seat, on the armrest, there is a QR code. And if you scan that, it'll take you to a survey. And we're trying to make some decisions to make room for people at our church and trying to decide when to add services this year, okay, which is a good problem, okay, it's good, it's good. Few of you excited about that, okay? Um, And those are the people looking for seats currently, okay? Here's our goal as a church, just so you know. We want to have open seats at optimal times. Open seats at optimal times, which means when people pull into the parking lot and they come to church for the first time, they can find a place to sit. And so we want to create space for them. And we need your help to do that. So if you could take this survey, it would help us immensely make plans uh, to do ministry here in the city this year. Okay, sound good? I need more of you. Okay, there we go. You're like, it's a survey. What do you want me to do? Clap for a survey? Yes, okay. You're, <laughs> uh, hey, starting off the series together, I, uh, uh, some of you, you grew up like I did. Uh, I grew up in church. I grew up going to church all the time. The reason is because uh, my dad had a lot of jobs growing up. One, he was a roofer. And uh, this was in the, uh, the South in the 80s and 90s. And I grew up roofing houses with my dad, if you could believe that or not. And in fact, that's how I knew I was supposed to go into ministry because I did not want to be on roofs for the rest of my life. Uh, my dad uh, was a jeweler for a little while. Uh, he, he also, but he had a job, and here's why I tell you that. He had a job for a while. He was a, a Baptist pastor. And so uh, I, that meant I grew up in church. And if you grew up like I did, as a, as a church kid, a church rat, you know, you're just in church all the time, especially as a Baptist pastor's kid. And uh, we had church every night of the week. If we were not in church one night of the week, I was like, what did we do wrong? Did the rapture happen and we didn't make it? I don't know. We're not in church. Uh, Monday night, we were in church. Tuesday night, we had what was called Tuesday night visitation. Anybody grow up like that? You're like, one person, okay. <laughs> and that's my dad right there. Uh, we had Wednesday night was... Uh, discipleship programs, all ages in the church. Thursday night, I don't know what we did. We'd meet up and we'd go to church. It was just church. It was all the time. And Tuesday night visitation, uh, this is going to sound so bizarre to some of you, but this this is my childhood, okay? And so uh, don't laugh. But we would meet up at the church at five o'clock. Some of you are going to go, that's a great idea. We would meet up at the church on Tuesday night at five o'clock and you meet in the fellowship hall. Anybody grew up in a church with a fellowship hall? It was great. You fellowship there. It was great. Uh, the, the fellowship hall was the place you gather and you would get a list of addresses and you would get deployed out to the neighborhoods and you would knock on doors and you would invite people to go to church. And it was terrifying. I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, my dad was really good at it. We would, you know, show up in somebody's neighborhood, knock, knock, knock. Half the time you would get cussed out and people would say, go, why are you here? Uh, the other half of the time, my dad would get invited into the house And I'd be like, oh, no, here he goes. You know, we're going in. And uh, they would make you tea or whatever. And dad would be like, drink the tea. You know, we're trying to get him to come to church. So I'm over there drinking tea as an eight-year-old. And and I remember moments. My dad, and this was really cool, he would lead people to Christ in their home. And he'd known them three minutes, okay? And he could get them to pray a prayer. He could get them to confess things. And it was was sometimes I was like, I got to go. I'm not supposed to be in here. But that was, that was a part of church. And then when it was over, when Tuesday night visitation was over, what you would do around seven o'clock, you go back to the, to the fellowship hall for spaghetti dinner and everybody would come back. We were like hunters returning to the lodge after the kills, okay? And you would tell the stories of what happened. This guy got cussed out. This guy, you know, 15 people came to faith. And I think that guy's name was Larry and I think he was always lying. But you were always just telling the story and that was kind of how it worked. And some of you hear that and you go, why don't we do that? That's a great idea. Uh, because for some of us, you grew up in, in a church where, I mean, the whole point of church was just to kind of share your faith, to talk about your faith. Uh, I went to church, churches like that for years and years. In fact, I remember in college, the, the, the sermon would end every Sunday and the pastor would stand up and say, here's our goal. Next week, we're gonna fill the building. We're gonna fill the building. And everybody kind of knew that was the mission of church. We were just supposed to fill the building and I remember thinking, why don't we just build a smaller building? I mean, if that's our goal, I mean, that's, if that's the point. 
But that was kind of the goal. And some of you, I mean, if you're honest, you feel guilty all the time that you don't share your faith more. You feel guilty, and that's the point of this series, for me to make you feel more guilty, okay? Uh, Just kidding. But you feel that all the time. We should be talking about our faith. We should be sharing our faith. I mean, gosh, look at the world. We need to be talking about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. Others of us, if you are a recent convert, a late convert to faith, or you became a Christian later in life, you hear that and you go, we're not doing that, right? I mean, that, that just sounds so bizarre. In fact, Jared, if I'm honest with you, that sounds arrogant. In fact, I'm pretty sure at my office, that's an HR violation to start talking about your faith. And who are you or who are we to tell people what they should believe and who really knows anyway? And some of us, you would say, it's a big deal that I'm in church, let alone, am I supposed to get other people to come to church? I mean, that just sounds you know, just just ridiculous that that would be the point. And part of this, this series, the heart behind this, is, is just a numbers game, if I'm honest with you, because you know this as well as I do, every article you read, uh, the amount of people in our nation that profess Christianity that would say there's a God, it's dwindling. In fact, this past week, somebody in our church sent me this article. I think it was in, uh, it was in The Guardian. And it said this, in 1972, 92% of Americans said they were Christian. Uh, that was thanks to my dad, by the way. Uh, Pew reported... <laughs> Uh, but by, by, by 2070, now don't miss this, by 2070, that number will drop to below 50%. Now that maybe doesn't even mean anything to you because we're just kind of living our lives and you're like, well, I'm in church, you know, my kids are in church. But the, the, just historically, that is unprecedented. That in any nation anywhere that a, a religion would dwindle to that degree, my goodness, that is in a hundred year span, that is historically, that has never even happened before. And yet we live in the middle of a culture where uh, for a a myriad of reasons, that is what's happening. And you know, as well as I do, to talk about your faith is becoming increasingly difficult. And the goal of this series is not to say, well, all the good Christians are those who are really good at converting people and, you know, getting more people to come to church. The goal of this series is is that you and I would recognize the kingdom of God is advancing all around you. Regardless of any pew research, the kingdom of God, what Jesus announced on a hillside 2,000 years ago, Peter, Andrew, I'm gonna build my church and the gates of hell are not gonna stop it, is still advancing in the world. And you and I, specifically you and I, have been placed in spheres of influence And the goal of faith, and and it's really easy to, nobody ever says this, but this becomes the goal of faith. My goal is just to be a Christian and not get influenced by culture. I mean, how many of you feel that way? My goal is just to kind of go through the world and not get influenced by people who are out there or by whatever it is. And rather, the heart of this series and the heart of the New Testament is not that you would just die having not been influenced, but rather you would enter into the spheres of influence where God has placed you and you would go influence you would go change the culture. You and I wouldn't just live a life saying, I hope I don't get eaten up by the culture, but rather we would press against it and we would be the mouthpieces and the hands and the feet of Jesus to the people around us, articulating and inviting people into a relationship with a God that is already pursuing them. And you have a role to play in that. And I have a role to play in that. And God's inviting us to participate in his unfolding plan for all of humanity. So if you have a Bible, let's dive in this together. You ready? Okay. I'm still filling out that survey, man. Back off. Okay. Uh, the, the plan of salvation for God's whole world has been unfolding since Jesus stepped into the world. It's really been unfolding since the Garden of Eden. He's calling all people into a relationship with himself, and he's inviting us to participate in it. And it's not about you having the right words in the right moment. It's really about you and I recognizing God's doing something everywhere, all around me all the time. And I get the opportunity to play a role in that. And I don't know what that role is for myself. You don't always know what the role is for you, but I want to participate in it. And God wants me to influence people. This was the very early invitation to the disciples. Uh, Now, if you're new to church, this is kind of how it works. In the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and very good, Uh, Jesus invites these guys, these 12 guys to follow him. 
And these are called the 12 disciples. They're the guys that the whole thing of Christianity starts with these 12. And his first invitation was to, four of the 12 were, were guys that fished for a living. That was their job. And he invites them and notice what he says. And this is the invitation to discipleship. Now, growing up, I thought discipleship, you've probably heard that word before. It, I thought it was like a, a class in the basement of the church. You know, that was what discipleship was. It was a 12-step thing you did somewhere. And in the New Testament, it doesn't look at discipleship that way. It looks at discipleship as the invitation for anybody who believes in Jesus to, to follow him. This is what it looks like. And it starts with this invitation to Simon Peter and to Andrew and to you and to me today. He says this, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, which was his hometown where he hung out, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were at work. They were just doing their job. It says they were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. And Jesus says in verse 19, come follow me. Now we don't even know if they know who he is. And Jesus said, and I will send you out to do what? To what's the phrase? What's the three words? To, to fish for people. Who takes that invitation? Uh, what do you even mean by that? We're just trying to catch fish to feed our families and to pay our bills. And he says, I will make you fishers of people. Some translations, yours might read fishers of men. At once they left their nets and they followed him, which you go, why? That sounds bizarre. Uh, but at once they leave their nets and they say, okay, we're gonna be your disciples. Now notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, hey, come be my disciple and day one, here's the plan. I'm gonna give you colored pencils and we're gonna sit in a circle and we're gonna just study the word together. That's what it means to be a disciple, okay? Now, is that a part of discipleship? Absolutely. Some of you have the colored pencils right now and you're about to throw them at me because you're like, I love my colored pencils. Um, some of you are like, what do you mean by colored pencils? Studying the Bible, it's a whole other thing. Anyway, the 830 got it. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, Jesus doesn't say, hey, come follow me. I'm gonna make you so wise. People are gonna be so impressed with how much you know. He doesn't say, hey, come follow me, Peter, Andrew. I, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna make you so self-disciplined. What time do you guys get up? You get up at six. I'm gonna have you getting up at four. You're gonna, I mean, people are gonna be blown away at your self-discipline if you follow me. Certainly that's a part of following Jesus. But he says, no, 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 come follow me. I'm gonna make you influential. I'm gonna make you the kind of person that steps into a sphere of influence in the world and regardless of your communication ability, Simon Peter, regardless of how talented or how much you think you know, I'm gonna raise you up to be an influencer in the places and in the spheres of, of the world that you live in. Uh, I'm gonna do something in you and through you. And I'm not just, and here's the, the, the big hook, okay? I'm not just calling you radically into something. I'm gonna push you radically out to make a difference in the world. And that's the, the crux of discipleship. I'm, as, as your heavenly father, I'm radically calling you into something. You have been called into a faith by God. You didn't take up Christianity. Christianity took you up. And in the process, God calls you in and we get the end part. We're supposed to gather, we're supposed to sing, we're supposed to study, we're supposed to read the Bible, we're supposed to worship God, we're supposed to do all that stuff. We're called radically in. But Jesus at the very outset says, hey, this whole discipleship program, it's not just about coming radically in, it is about being called radically out to go and influence the world. And you have been assigned somewhere in your office, in your dorm, at your high school, for a specific reason, to make a difference there and participate in the unfolding of the kingdom of God and inviting people into a relationship with a God who's inviting everybody into a relationship with himself. And that's a different mindset. And some of you, I mean, even as I say it, be honest, how many of you, you would say, I would feel so awkward talking about my faith or talking about God with anybody. I mean, just be honest, it's church, it's okay to be honest. Um, how many of you, yeah, uh, I don't even know what I would say. Uh, in fact, even as I talk about it, some of you are like, I would rather go scrub toilets in the nursery than you know, 
talk about faith with somebody because for some of us, if, if you got really honest, you just feel inadequate to talk about your faith. Anybody? I mean, just, just be honest. No? The 10 o'clock? You guys are like, no, we do this every day. We don't even need this series, man. <laughs> In fact, Jared, we're going to try to lead you to Jesus later. We we're a little concerned. Uh, yeah, be honest. How many of you, you have started a conversation of faith with somebody, or you got into a conversation of faith with a coworker, a friend, and a few minutes in, you thought, what am I doing? I need to shut up. I feel so stupid. And they started asking you questions, and your whole, I mean, you were like, I don't even know what I believe now. They started you know, asking you, well, where were the dinosaurs on the ark? And do you even, and you're like, I don't know where the dinosaurs were. And <laughs> your faith kind of, crumbled in that moment and you thought I am never opening my big fat mouth again to talk about God or any you know because I just felt so stupid in that moment and and the whole heart of this Jesus says I'm doing the work I'm doing the inviting I just want you to be on the front lines and participate in pointing people to the God who's already at work and I just want to relieve the pressure today the message is not all the good Christians are those who are really good at converting people. That's not your job. The Spirit of God is already at work and in inviting people in a relationship with Himself. You and I just have to have a posture of saying, okay, God, I have been called radically into something. And it's not just to stay in the holy huddle, high five another Christians going, I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? Yeah, woo, we're in. And sitting back in the recliner of God's grace going, this is great. We just love, woo, we're going to eat popcorn and just talk about Jesus. Instead, I have been called radically into something to go radically out. And I have been sent into an office. I have been sent into a, a hallway. I've been sent into a world. I've been sent into... Wherever you go this week, the DMV, I am there on purpose and God's placed me here. And that's a different posture. And it's our job to engage with culture and to make a difference and not say, I just don't want to be influenced, but rather I'm here to influence those around me. I'm here to go fish. I'm here to go first in fishing. I'm here to be an initiator of conversations of faith and to point people to the God who's already revealing himself to everyone. And that's part of the mission mindset of this church, of the church for 2,000 years. And I know for some of us, especially if you grew up in church, there's some postures or ways that you were taught to engage with culture. And I wanna do just, just for a second, because in the modern world, I think it's helpful to break these down. And for some of us, even if you were not raised in church, you bumped against Christians that uh, maybe they, they uh, talk to you about faith from one of these positions or postures. And I'm not being negative on any of these. I'm not saying any of them are wrong or I'm not endorsing any of them either. Uh, but one posture, and many of us, you grew up this way, I would call it the evacuation approach. And you grew up thinking, okay, the whole point of faith is that one day God's gonna burn the world up and it's our job just to evacuate as many people as you can. And so the whole thing of being a Christian is you tell people like the five laws or the five truths and you get them to pray a prayer. And if you can get them to pray that prayer, they have, you know, they're going to go up one day with you. And so every conversation, you know, you get people to come to church and they say, well, what are we supposed to do now that we're a Christian? Just get more people to come to church. And then they come to church. What are we supposed to do? Just get more people to come to church. Just, well, what's the point of faith? Just to get people to come to faith. I, I remember when I was in college, I had a friend that uh, every restaurant we would go to, and, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not being critical, and in fact, it was inspiring at times. We would sit down in the restaurant, and he would make it his mission to lead the waiter or waiter to Jesus in that hour. <laughs> and he had a whole kind of setup. The person would come over, and they would say, hey, I'm John. I'm going to be taking your order. Can I get you guys started with the drinks? And, and my friend, he would say, uh, hey, just so you know, my friend Jared and I are Christ followers. And is there anything we can pray for you about? And the guy or the waitress would look back and say, I was just going to bring you a blooming onion. I don't, I don't know. And over the course of the, the meal, you know, he was trying. He was trying every angle. 
And, and that mindset comes from, hey, we got to get as many people out of here as you can. And our job is just to share faith and share faith and share faith. And again, I'm not being critical of that. I'm, if you grew up that way, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. I think all of these tend to lack balance or perspective. Uh, there's another view. Uh, many of you grew up this way, and I would call it the activist approach. And it was the opinion, it was the approach that Christians are supposed to be uh, in positions of power. And it's our job just to get as many Christians in positions of power politically, uh, principles, you know, Christian, just put Christians in positions of power. And if we can just kind of dominate everything, uh, then we, we just kind of have it made. And so our job is just to, to put, put Christians in position of power. Our job is just to put Christians uh, in, in positions of influence. And that, that was kind of the whole thing. And again, I'm not knocking any of these. These are just different perspectives of faith uh, that we have for how we engage culture. Uh, some of us, and I would say this is maybe the majority of us, uh, this was very popular in the late 20th century. Uh, you grew up in what I would call, or you participated in, or you're a part of what I would call the relevant approach. And it was the idea that essentially, and I'm being overly simplistic, but that culture is becoming more progressive. And as Christians, we don't want to offend anybody and we have to kind of keep up with the times. And so consequently, it's our job as a church just to kind of be like a social agency. You know, you help feed the homeless, you do some counseling sessions, but when you go to work, don't be too pushy, don't be too loud. Uh, in fact, faith's kind of a private thing, kind of go along with that. And some of us, that's your worldview, which is why even as I talk about this, you're going, I'm not doing that because we're supposed to be, you know, kind of the quiet, kind, you know, that, that's kind of the posture of faith. Others of us, and I've talked to many of you this way, you grew up in what I would call the separatist approach. And the separatist approach was essentially this, don't engage with culture at all. In fact, the, the mindset is essentially, if you try to make the world like the church, all you're gonna do is make the church like the world, it's better just to stay away. And so consequently, what you end up doing, and again, I'm, I'm not making fun, but you, you just kind of hang out with Christians, you only do things that are labeled Christian, you only watch Christian movies, you only listen to Christian music, you only, you know, if it's labeled, you inconspicuously consume anything labeled Christian, anything else is bad, you only eat Christian breath mints because other breath mints are bad. Those are real, by the way, they're called New Testaments, in case you're wondering. Um, I'm not making this up. Some of you are Googling it right now. You're like, what? Pez dispensers are from the devil. You all know that. Uh, but that was kind of the, the, the perspective that many of you have. And again, I'm not knocking any of those. Those are all different ways that Christians engage with culture. What I would say is that they all tend to lack balance. And what I would say is this, the caveat to that is that there's two things that we tend to forget. One is that creation is good that God is not gonna burn up this world, God is going to restore this world. And he invites us into the reclamation project and that's not just oceans and mountains and environment, that's people. God wants to restore all people to the relationship that he had with all people in the Garden of Eden. And what that means for you and I is that God cares way more about your neighbor than you care about your neighbor. God wants a relationship with him far more than you want him to have a relationship with God. And he invites you into that reclamation project. He invites you into participating in drawing somebody to himself, which means it's not your job to start from ground zero and say, how in the world am I ever gonna to talk to Frank who gets drunk every Friday and Saturday about God? God is already revealing himself. And he invites you through your words, through your actions, through your life to point to the reality of God that is already there. And in participating in the, in the reclamation project of all things. Uh, the second caveat I would add to that is something called common grace. Uh, grace is not just for those of us who believe. Everybody has experienced the grace of God. Anybody who's ever seen a sunset, anyone who's ever uh, had a hug from another individual, anyone who's ever you know, eaten an In-N-Out burger, I don't know, they've experienced the grace of God, the kindness of God. Uh, has, has been extended in their direction, which means it's not your job to convince somebody that there is a God and he is full of grace. They have already experienced it and you're just pointing and revealing the God that is already there. And at times there will be people in your sphere of influence when you do that, 
that will be so glad you communicated it because they've already felt that. You invite them to come to church. You invite them to experience or pray. And they're gonna say, I'm so glad you said this because I felt this tug. It's all, this God is already at work. You're not initiating the work. This God is already at work and he's inviting you to play a role in it. And that's a different posture. And it's the posture of, I just, I just am radically out I, mean, I got called radically in and I gotta go radically out. And God's gonna use me in ways that I never dreamed of when I first became a Christ follower. God's gonna use you in so many powerful ways. If you just begin to pray and think that way, how do you want to use me here? How do you wanna use me in this office? Uh, the whole discipleship program that Jesus started, if you read the Gospel of Luke in particular, the first eight chapters, he's recruiting, he's training, he's teaching. Okay, James, okay, Nathaniel, here's what it means to be a disciple. He's giving them the parables, he's giving them the stories. And then in Luke chapter nine, he goes, okay, boys, it's your turn. You're gonna go cast out the demons. You're gonna go heal the sick. You're gonna go share your faith. You're gonna be the ones who reveal the God who's at work everywhere. The kingdom's advancing Go participate in it. And they're looking at him like, that's a bad idea, boss. I don't know if we have what it takes. And he says, no, 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 you have what it takes. And so in Luke chapter 10, notice what he says. They've gone from 12 to 72. I love this. And it says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Verse three, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. I love that. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't do the halftime speech to your football team, man? Uh, like lambs among wolves, go get them. Uh, what does he mean by that? He means, look, the first eight chapters, guys, this was all comfortable and you heard stories and you high-fived and you sat around campfires and you thought, wow, walking on water, that's incredible. The, the rest of this journey, radically out. The rest of this journey, you are gonna see things, experience things. I'm gonna use you in ways that you're gonna think you're, you're gonna die at times. You're gonna shrivel up. You're not gonna know what to do. But if at some point you don't feel like you're in over your skis, you're not really living faith. If at some point it's just the holy huddle and you're kind of sticking together, you're not really living this thing out. And I'm pushing you out. In fact, Peter, James, Andrew, this is how God's always worked. In fact, if you go back to the Old Testament, what is it over and over again? It's radically in, radically out. God meets a guy named Abraham. He says, okay, Abraham, you don't know me, but I kind of made everything and I'm calling you radically in. You're part of my family. And Abraham gets like eight sentences in and he says, okay, God, what am I supposed to do? He goes, go radically out, <laughs> get out. Uh, you're you're going to go bless everybody, everybody, everybody. <laughs> Uh, then God meets a guy named Moses. Remember that story through a, a, a burning shrub? And he says, okay, Moses, I'm calling you in. And Moses says, well, what do you want me to do? I want you to go to the Pharaoh radically out. I'm calling you radically out, Moses. Remember he meets Isaiah? And Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And God says, I can fix that. I'll clean your lips. Now go, get out, go prophesy, go preach, go teach, go tell people about the advancing kingdom of God. Paul, over and over again, radically in, radically out. So what do you think that means for you and for I as disciples? Radically in, not just to stay in, but at some point to get in over your skis and go radically out. And I don't mean you gotta move to Sri Lanka or wherever. I just mean in your offices, in your hallways. I'm here on purpose. Josh talked about this verse last week, Ephesians 2, verse 10. And I just want to read it because I, I love this verse and I love the way he taught it. And I, I love the application for what we're talking about today. He says, for we are God's handiwork. This is Paul, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You go, well, I can't go radically out. I, I don't even know what I believe half the time. And I don't know how to answer the questions. God has already prepared you in advance he sent you into the world. Do you realize how opposite that is from what culture would teach you? Culture essentially says, look, you're here in this world by accident and the whole thing's random and it's what you make of it. Meaning is whatever you decide meaning is. It doesn't really matter. Do with your life what you want. The Bible takes an opposing view and says, no, you have not accidentally fallen into this world. You have been sent into this world by God for a purpose. 
And part of that purpose is the people who are currently in your sphere and influencing them and experiencing the kingdom of God that is already unfolding around them and around you. And you go, well, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Your story, your life story has uniquely prepared you for something and to influence a somebody. Your highs, your lows, your valleys, your mountaintops, your 30 years, your 50 years, it's all prepared you. To be more specific, there are, certainly ha- there, there are certain hands in this world that only you can hold. There are certain needs that only you can meet. There are certain demons that only you can drive out because somewhere in your story, they got driven out of you. And God calls you to participate in that work. He says, go, I've sent you into that relationship for a very specific purpose. Well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. In fact, God, I'm kind of a mess myself. And if you go through life and you go, well, I'm just such a mess and I don't know what to do. I don't mean this to sound harsh, but the cross robs you of your ability to have shame. The cross robbed you when you said yes to Jesus. You don't get to go through life anymore talking about how bad you are and how terrible you've been and all the ways in which you mess up. The cross robbed you of that ability. The cross put your shame to death. And now even if you're a mess, even if you go, well, I'm broken and I don't know what to say and I don't know what to do. God says, I'm still going to use you because guess what? The world's a mess and it needs people who aren't perfect and polished. It needs people like you. And you don't get the right to sit in faith as a self-absorbed Christian just talking about your issues and please pray for me and, I know, and all that's fine and good. But at some point, you gotta go out. And it's in the process of going out, you experience what God wants you to experience, being used by him to see his kingdom advance in the world. And if you're honest, the only reason you're here, the only reason you're a Christ follower is because at some moment, somebody had the courage to tell you about faith. And God says, just do that for somebody else. But I don't know what to say. God says, I'm already at work. And given your life story and given who you are, I've assigned you into this relationship. And just, here's the the goal this week. Just start praying and thinking, God, who is it? Some of you, even as I've been saying it, you already know. And you go, well, what if I get rejected? Jesus says, well, I'm glad you asked if I get rejected because he says this to to them because they did get rejected. And he says this in verse 16, he says, whoever listens to me or listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. In other words, he says, don't worry about it because they're not rejecting you. They're actually just rejecting me. He says, but whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me, who sent me. He says, listen, I'm inviting you in to talk about the creator of all things with people. And and there's gonna be times you're gonna get rejected. People are not gonna agree with you. People aren't gonna like you. And he says, that's okay, James, Peter, Jared, just brush your feet off and go on to the next person, the next town. And it's not, oh, I'm gonna get rejected. The, The reality is everybody is sharing their faith with everybody. We're all doing that. You can't stop it. Every human being does it. You say, what do you mean by that? If I say to you, well, you shouldn't talk about what you believe, what am I doing? I'm telling you what I believe. (laughs) If I say to you, hey, you shouldn't make truth claims, what am I doing? I'm making a truth claim. Uh, If I say to you, hey, uh, you shouldn't try to convert people, that's wrong. What am I doing? I'm trying to convert you to my way of thinking. Everybody does it. We're all arguing about cosmology and you know, how we think the world works. We're all doing it. If I say to you, hey, you shouldn't evangelize. It's wrong. What, what, in the very nature of telling you not to evangelize, what am I doing? I'm evangelizing you to my position. We all do it. And Jesus says, hey, in the process of sharing your faith, I just want you to surrender the outcome. It's not your responsibility. And what you should be concerned with is not rejection. Rather, it's your motivation. Don't do this because you go, well, I'm so good at it. Look at all these people that I've influenced. And it's possible, and many of you met Christians like this, they start to puff themselves up and go, well, I'm, you know, the whole point of faith is, you know, it's like a hunter going out and killing deer. You know, look at all these kills I got. Uh, it's not, that should not be your motivation. In fact, that begins to happen with some of the disciples and notice what Jesus says in verse 16. He says, or verse 17, he says, the 72 returned to, uh, with joy and they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. In other words, 
Wow, we were just fishing a few weeks ago and now the spirits are falling in submission to us. And they were starting to get puffed up with pride. And Jesus looks at them and he says in the next part, verse 20, he says, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In other words, your motivation is not to be effective. It's not, hey, all the good Christians are those who've gotten all the people converted. I'm just inviting you to participate in it. And you participate in it because you know I have called you into a relationship with myself. And your motivation is my name is written in heaven. God has, has chosen to write my name in what the book of Revelation says is the Lamb's book of life. Now that sounds kind of odd to us, but in the ancient world, uh, every town that you would go to would have a book at the front of it. And if you were a noble person or a person of influence in that town, your name would be in the book. And so when the scriptures use that phrase, that's what it means. God has called you noble. God has called you into a position of leadership. God has put you in the book. And the way religion works, and this is how it worked in the Old Testament, Moses references this, religion believes, any religion, that there is a book on the other side of eternity, and if you live a good life, when your life is over, God or the gods will get the book out, and if you're, you have more good deeds than bad deeds, your name is in the book. And notice what Jesus says to him. Here's what I want you to rejoice about, that your name is already in the book, to which the 12 would say, but we're not even dead yet. <laughs> in other words, we could still mess it up. And Christianity is, it's not based on your merit. It's based on your faith. Rejoice in that. Wrap your identity, not in how effective you are, or how moral you are, or how many people came to Christ because you're in the world. Rejoice because God has chosen through your faith to call you into a relationship with himself. That's your motivation. That's where you anchor your identity. The, the message of Christianity, if you're new here, that the whole thing is simply this. Jesus Christ's name was blotted out of the Lamb's book of life so that your name could be written in. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself on a cross and he called out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? So that you could enter into a relationship with that same Father. That's the message. That's where we anchor our identity. That's where we anchor our sense of self. And if it's in anything else, I'm effective. Listen, you, you, your whole faith is gonna rise. If your whole faith rises and falls with how effective you are, how moral you are, it won't last. It has to be anchored in. God has called me into a relationship with himself. And anything else, it's, it's fleeting. It doesn't last. And he says, that's, what I, God, that's your motivation. Now go out into the world and help people see that their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I invite them to participate in this relationship with the God of all things who's calling all people to himself. And I want you as your heavenly father to have a story of how God used you. You thought, well, I was just kind of working at Hewlett Packard, you know? And he goes, no, no, no. I had you there for a reason. I was just kind of going through my life, getting coffee one morning, and I met this individual. God says, I had you in that coffee shop for a reason. Go first, go live with that mindset, go fish, and you will have a story. Thank God I was called radically in, and thank God I was available to go radically out and be the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece of Jesus to the world. Isn't that what you want? This week, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Just think about one person. Maybe somebody you go, I know I've been, I need to invite them to church. One person, and it's not a, a paragraph or a book you gotta give them or a long speech. It's just a sentence or two of, hey, I'm praying for you. And start to see in, in fishing, uh, who takes the bait? Who is it that God's already reeling into a relationship with himself? And you may get the joy of participating in the process of what God is already doing in somebody's life. And that would be an incredible story for you to tell in 2023, wouldn't you agree? Of how God used you to influence and he gave you a front row seat to his kingdom unfolding in this world. Let's pray together. God, we thank you. You've invited us in and you push us out. God, thank you that you have invited every single one of us into a relationship with yourself. And it's not our job to write the name in. It's not our job to be the, the perfect mouthpiece. It's just our job to live with an awareness. God, how do you want to use me here? 
And I pray for somebody here who's just butting up against their inadequacies. They don't feel enough. They don't feel smart enough. They don't know what to say. They don't have the gift of speech. God, I pray more than anybody else, would you use them this week? They're just standing in the moment saying, I'm available. God, I pray for a a high school student, maybe within the sound of my voice today. I pray for our sons and daughters on the other side of this wall. Uh, We pray and we beg, God, don't let them be influenced. God, I pray more than that. I pray they would go and influence. Would high schools and middle schools and elementary schools be different places because our sons and daughters are being raised up to go first and to go fish? Would we not just be thermostats reflecting a culture, but would we be a thermometer that's, that's the shifting culture in a different direction. God, that's our prayer. Would we be the kind of people that are changing the world around us? God, would you raise us up, call us in and call us out. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's children said, amen. Grace and peace.
Hey, thanks for coming to church with us today. We want you to know that we are here for you. If you want to connect with a pastor or counselor, please call the church at the number below. And don't forget to engage with our daily devotionals and worship throughout the week with garden music wherever you like to stream. We'll see you next time.